So, today we shall start talking about a new concept which many of you have seen in the context of Euclidean spaces presumably, but we will introduce it more formally particularly for more abstract vector spaces that we are now going to handle and deal with in this course. So, the idea is of linear independence, all right. So, when do we say a bunch of vectors is linearly independent? When you cannot get a vector out of some linear combination of other vectors. Mm. Sorry? Okay. But I just want to visit that point what uh, another of your friends has mentioned because that is quite interesting. So, what can you say about this particular set? Suppose this is the vector space and I plucked out this vector. So, how does your definition work for this? You see that is yeah, but then you are adding more clauses right. Just now you said that if a vector cannot be represented as a combination linear combination of other vectors then we are done, but that is not it. So, we need to be more specific and precise about the way we define things which is why we will go for the following description which is to say that if a non maybe hyphenated word non trivial linear combination of vectors in a set S which is contained in the vector space V does not or rather if let us let us take the opposite because I have kept that provision open. So, that is an easier definition and we can say does lead to then what do we say about such a set? So, what is it the attribute of it is an attribute of a set of vectors whenever I talk about the property of linear independence or linear dependence I have to know what sort of object I am categorizing. It is a set of vectors in a vector space whose linear independence or dependence is being debated all right. So, what do we say in the, this case if a non trivial so of course, this non trivial I have not defined or described yet, but hopefully you understand we will we'll describe that do not worry. If a non trivial linear combination of vectors in a set leads to a resulting vector that is this then what do we say about that set right. Then S is linearly dependent. Now, of course, conversely if no non trivial linear combination can ever lead to the 0 vector right then it is linearly independent right. So, that is what the description is. So, never ever try to define this linear independence by saying one vector represented in terms of the other vectors that is not necessarily true particular case being when you have the 0 vector. However, this definition accommodates everything all possible eventualities are covered herein right. So, I will give you one example of something that you may not view as a vector at first glance because you normally think of n tuples as vectors, but let us say I consider the vector space to be. So, when I write this it means this is a vector space of polynomials of degree 2 or less whose coefficients are real numbers ok that is the that is the notation. 
So this is a vector space. You can go ahead and check that it satisfies all the properties of vector spaces. If you understand what addition of polynomials are in the conventional sense and what multiplying a polynomial by a real number is. So of course this is over the field of real numbers, right? Now consider the set. Note that these are all members of this vector space, right? The claim is that this is linearly independent. How do we show this? There are multiple ways of showing this. Any one way of showing if this is linearly independent? If not, then let us try out. So C naught times 1 plus C1 times x plus C2 times x squared. Suppose this is equal to the 0 polynomial. The identically 0 polynomial. Note, this is not an equation I am writing. Okay? This, is a, this is a polynomial and this is a 0 polynomial. There is a difference. Okay? If you look at it like that without any context and all of this structure, you might think this is a quadratic equation. No, it is not a quadratic equation. I am saying that there will have to exist some C0, C1 and C2, some real numbers. So let us say C0, C1 and C2 are some real numbers. If I can find out some C0, C1 and C2, some real valued C0, C1, C2 that results in the 0 polynomial, then I will show that, I will have shown that this is linearly dependent. But the claim is that this is linearly independent. So I should somehow be able to show that this can only result in a 0 polynomial if this is, yeah, this all these 3 have to be 0. So of course because you know that over the real numbers this polynomials are differentiable, you can just go ahead and use the fact that this has to be true for all x because it is 0 in the sense of the polynomial, remember? So it is true for all x. Right? That is the idea of linear independence in this case. So this must be true for all x. So in general, if it is true for all x, specifically it must be true for x is equal to 0. If you plug in x is equal to 0, you are led to conclude that c0 is equal to 0. And then you can of course go ahead and differentiate, but there is another way of seeing this, you see, because you know that over the real field, 1 must exist, which is the multiplicative identity. So once you have established that C0 must be 0, then you are left with C1 x squared, sorry, C1 x plus C2 x squared must now be 0. Now go ahead and plug in x is equal to plus 1. And what you will have is C1 plus C2 is equal to 0. Also, in the field you know, in the real field, that 1 exists, minus 1 also exists. So you can go ahead and plug in minus 1. So this is for x is equal to 1. And finally, for x is equal to minus 1, you can just take minus c1 plus c2 is equal to 0. Already you have seen c0 is 0. Now of course based on these, it is immediately apparent that both c1 and c2 must also be 0. And therefore, the only way to result in the 0 polynomial identically for all x using these vectors from this vector space is to choose C0, C1 and C2, all three of them to be equal to 0. And therefore, this set is linearly independent, right? Is that clear? So this is an example of a set sitting within a vector space, which is linearly independent, which looks nothing like the n tuple of numbers, right? Okay. Having understood this, I will make a couple of claims or maybe two or three claims and I will argue that this, these must be true. Okay? So suppose S, this is a subset okay, within a vector space. I am not writing this. You, by now you understand when I write this as a v, it is a vector space, okay? is linearly 
independent. I'm writing the shorthand. Hmm? For any S bar which is a subset of S, we have that S bar or rather S underlined is also linearly independent. Is this obvious? How do we go about trying to prove something like this, a claim such as this? Once again, we try to contradict this. So we try to assume first that suppose S bar, S bar which contains at most all the members of S, in which case by definition it is linearly independent. But if it contains fewer fellows than S, let us assume that S bar contains some of the fellows that are there in S, not all of them. Because if it contains all of them, then it's just S and S is by our claim linearly independent, nothing to prove then. But suppose S bar, S underlined contains some of the fellows of S only and that some of them are not contained in S underlined, the subset. If despite that, it turns out that this S underlined, this set is linearly dependent, then is it possible that S can still continue to be linearly independent? Right? Because if there is a non-trivial linear combination of fellows here, you might just as well go and append the fellows that are not here, but here with coefficient 0. You will still have a non-trivial combination. Non-trivial combination means at least one of those coefficients is non-zero. Now, as long as you found some of the fellows here to have non-zero coefficient, you might as well pad the rest with zero coefficients. It will still be a non-trivial combination. So it is not possible that any subset thereof, a subset of a linearly independent set has to also be linearly independent. Right? And by the same token, kind of a converse relationship, suppose S contained within a vector space V, again I am not, okay, let me just, just mention that this is a subset, is linearly dependent. Now, for any S bar which is contained within, sorry, which contains S and of course S bar is also, of course it is part of V, right, linearly dependent. So for any S bar within which this linearly dependent set is sitting, yeah, we must have S bar as a linearly dependent set. I mean already it is defective, defective in the sense that it has lost its linear independence within S. S is already linearly dependent. So any superset of a linearly dependent set must be, you cannot build a structure on weak ground, right? You already lost linear independence in the set S itself. You cannot hope to extend it to a bigger set which contains everything that is there already in S and still hope to build a in linearly independent structure out of it, linearly independent set out of it, right? Once again, you can just try and fill in the arguments here. Just a couple of lines, you have to just assume that there are certain fellows belonging here, certain fellows belonging there and so on, right? And take combinations and argue. So I hope that these two assertions are very clear. And the third and important most, one of the most common assertions which we started this discussion with is this, any set S contained in the vector space V which contains the zero vector must be linearly dependent. Again, very straightforward. A ready-made choice, ready-made choice for a non-trivial linear combination is just 
attach some non-zero coefficient to the zero vector and attach a zero coefficient to all the other vectors. That is a non-trivial linear combination of fellows sitting inside S which results in zero. So this must be true. Any set that contains zero can never be linearly independent. Okay. Three claims that we have made, we have not even sort of dirtied our hands by trying to prove them, but hopefully we have presented arguments that have convinced you that these three are true. Okay. So that is the first important concept we have introduced today which is that of linear independence or linear dependence, the complementary properties. So once you understand one, you understand the other. Any questions so far? No, S bar is a superset of S. Yeah. Yeah. S bar is contained in the vector space of course. How can we say that? Why not? So S bar, this is a vector space. So S bar contains only fellows that are qualified as vectors within the vector space V. So I mean, uh, why not? So for example, let us say you have 1 x, 2 x, x squared, all right? And you have 1, let us say 1 x, x squared, that is it and 1x, 2x, x squared and let us say, what should I write, okay, 5x squared, 5x squared, yeah, and what should I say, let me just add a random number of elements here, 7x, 3x squared, 5x squared, yeah, and let us say this is 2x, okay. So already this is linearly dependent set. See these are all coming from that example that I had given, okay. So vector space over R, hmm. this is a linearly dependent set, why? because I can identically cook up just these two fellows here, yeah. So minus 2 times this vector plus 1 times this vector and the rest I can just put 0. So that is a non-trivial combination that leads to the 0 polynomial. Therefore this is a de linearly dependent set. Now this one contains every fellow that is here. So this is my S and this is my S bar. Now you see S bar must come from this as well. That is all that I am saying. Now my vector space is this, this is the V, right? That is all that I am claiming, yeah. So therefore, if you cook up a superset of a linearly dependent set to begin with, that superset also must be linearly dependent. Hmm. No, because otherwise it does not make sense. We are talking about subsets from the same vector space. You cannot compare apples and oranges, right? So this said, I mean, you can just add maybe three apples to this. I do not even know how to take their linear combinations unless I have all the objects coming from the same vector space. So 1x, 2x, 7x, 3x squared, 5x squared and 5 apples. That is not a vector space, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, both of them must be from the same vector space, only then we can compare this property of uh, linear independence and dependence and this subset relation and so on, right? So we will now introduce the second important concept for today's lecture, which is that of a generating set. Right. So what is a generating set? Once again, at the back of our minds, we should always do well to remember that there is a vector space that we have in mind. Everything that comes does come from that same vector space. Nothing is outside of that structure, okay? So suppose G, this is a subset or a set sitting inside the vector space V. So this is the vector space, this is a set, okay? 
let us you know subset is a given. So, you just read it as a set. So, there is a set that is contained in the vector space V. So, every element in this set G belongs to the vector space V is what I mean by this right such that the span of G is equal to V ok. That means by combining fellows that are contained inside this set G, I can cook up every vector that lives inside this vector space V ok. So, if I have such a set right, then G is a generating set for V. Do you think that the generating set needs to be unique? Once again think of the polynomial, I, I love to give the example of the polynomial because that is the first non uh, like you know simple example that you can give and yet it is not something that looks like an n-tuple at least not at first glance. Later on we shall see when we assign coordinates they are also like those n-tuples of numbers but nonetheless the point being that once again you see 1 x x squared yeah using these vectors you can generate every polynomial of degree 2 or less. By the same token, you can also take a 5, 7 x, 8 x, 3 x squared plus 2, 4 x squared. This, this is also a generating set, you can check, right. This is also a generating set for every polynomial of degree 2 or less, okay. So, of course, there is no question of having a unique or the generating set ok. It is it, it can all at best be a generating set for a vector space yeah that is why we do not talk about the generating uh, set for a given vector space. Once you come up with one generating set we are happy with that. So, these are examples yeah. So, these are generating sets this is G 1 and this is G 2 of course, the vector space we have in mind is again that same. Okay. Right. So, that is the idea of a generating set. If by combining fellows inside a given set you can cook up every possible vector that lives inside the vector space, it is a generating set for the aforesaid vector space. Right. But now we are going to try and trim it. So, how do we trim this generating set? We introduce the idea of a basis, okay. So, now we have the ideas of linear independence and of a generating set and we combine them to define what is a basis for a vector space ok. A set B contained inside the vector space V is said to be a basis for V if it is a linearly independent generating set for V. See none of those terms we have used now are not are, are undefined. We have defined what is linear independence, we have defined what a generating set is. So, based on our understanding of these two notions that is all we need in order to understand what a basis is, 
right. So, let us look at a few examples just to make things clearer. So, example 1, let us say the one we understand very well R n, n tuples of real numbers over R of course. And I put it to you that this bunch of vectors all right is a basis. right. How will you try and establish this? Well, it has to have two properties. You take any n tuple of numbers, it should be representable as a linear combination of these fellows. So, without loss of generality choose alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 till alpha n. You will see that it can be written as alpha 1 times the first one plus alpha 2 times the second one plus alpha 3 times the third one plus so on and so forth till alpha n times the last one. So, it is definitely a generating set. Then the next thing to check is whether this is also linearly independent. Suppose it is not, then you choose C1 times the first one plus C2 times the second one plus C3 times the third one so on till Cn times the last one. Equate that to the 0 vector in our n tuples that is all zeros. Now of course entry wise you have to compare if two vectors are equal, if two n tuples are equal then every one, one to one entry should be equal. So therefore C1 is equal to 0, C2 is equal to 0 and so on. Likewise, all the CIs must be equal to 0 and therefore, nothing but the trivial linear combination of these fellows can lead to the 0 n tuple and therefore, this is also linearly independent, right. So, this is indeed a basis, okay. Let us look at example 2 which is CN over C. Once again, the same B is still a basis. Go ahead and check. You can have n tuples of complex numbers and you can combine them linearly over the field of complex numbers. So, every of one of those n tuples is a complex number. So, you are free to choose those coefficients instead of real they can now be complex, right. So, again by the same token it has to be linearly independent and generating set. Again checking generating set whether the fact that this is indeed a generating set for this vector space over C. That is also readily evident. The fact that this is linearly independent is also follows the same line of reasoning as presented before. But now if I tweak this a bit, let us I should say n because this is probably a non example. Let us say C n over R. That is also a legitimate vector space, right. The field has changed, the set V has remained the same. Now, do you think B, now B's candidature is under question? Why? Is it still not linearly independent? Well, of course it is. It is still linearly independent. Just go ahead and take linear combinations of fellows in B over the real field. We have already seen it is linearly independent. So, where does it fail the span? So, what do you need to do in order to actually cook up a generating set for because it is a generating part where this has failed not the linear independence part. So, can you fix this? Same basis B but replace the 1 by I. Right. So, I, let me call that give that a no, new sort of a nomenclature notation like this and then I take the union of B and I B. Now, this does not remain a non example anymore. Now, it becomes an example of a basis, yeah. So, see that is why the field is very important. The vector space can only be studied and its structure understood in entirety only once we know over what field we are looking for, right. So, the same C n over C and C n over R, the basis what remains a basis in this fails to remain a basis in this 
right. So, these are important notions of course, you can go ahead and check that uh, polynomial the vector space of uh, polynomials of degree 2 or less you can go ahead and check that 1 x and x squared is also a basis for that yeah. The fact that it is a spanning or a, or a generating set is obvious just whatever are the coefficients of your polynomial just go ahead and put them as c0 times 1 plus c1 times x plus c2 times x squared and you have all possible values of c0, c1, c2 covering all possible polynomials of degree 2 or less yeah. So, this uh, generating part is done the linear independence we have already spoken of. In general you can take polynomials of degree n or less and check that 1 x x squared x cubed till x to the n they do indeed provide you with a basis for polynomials of degree n or less right. So, that we have with that we have understood two uh, the three fundamental notions and how they are tied together the idea of linear independence the idea of a generating set and now the idea of a basis these are very intimately connected with each other right and we have also seen a few examples I am sure you will find a lot more examples not just in the textbooks but also in the problem sheets that we shall be subsequently sending out okay. Any questions thus far? Oh I B is basically uh, I am just going to replace the ones here with I that is the square root of minus 1 the imaginary number it is just a name that I am giving it is not something sacrosanct that you will find in textbooks it is just I am defining for my purpose of, or my ease ok. So, every element in the set B being so called multiplied with the imaginary I I am calling that set as I B it is just my nomenclature ok. Uh, you can even say maybe it is non standard but that is the way it is like we have the argon plane we say R and j r in electrical engineering we use j for the square root of I, uh, minus 1 right. So, j r is the imaginary axis. So, I am just saying b and i b right. This is union. No, no, but these are sets these are not vector spaces b and i b are not vector spaces these are sets. So, we are we have only spoken about sums of subspaces remember not sums of sets right ok. Any further questions otherwise we will bring this module to a close and we will move over to the next ok yeah C n over r yeah. All the all the scalar r's can come from the set r yeah yeah no but ib is the set of vectors so members of b are first coming from cn so members of ib are also coming from cn so they are obviously n tuples of complex numbers so i is a legitimate complex number with specifically zero real part and one imaginary part so those are definitely members of cn it is only the scalars that you are now restricted to choose from only the real numbers not complex numbers. So, just that restriction includes I mean in, in, entails that you will now have to choose twice the size of the basis twice the number of elements that you had in the original basis in the this basis yeah ok.